Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rowan Baston, and I'm the acting head of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Deakin University, and uh, and I've been asked to MC tonight. What I want to emphasise about our speaker tonight is that he's uh, exemplary in terms of his forms of engagement as a public intellectual. And I'm speaking uh, of Dr. Scott Birchall, uh, who is known to many of you. Dr. Scott Birchall is uh, a senior lecturer in international relations uh, in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. And he's known to many of you uh, through his uh, extensive radio work, asked to give a lecture. He's come up with the title for the lecture that he's giving us tonight, which is The Challenges of Modern Life Towards an Intellectual Self-Defense. And I, for one, am very intrigued to hear what the self-defense is going to be uh, and also what those challenges are. And so with that, uh, I would ask you to welcome uh, Dr. Scott Burton. Oh, thank you, Ron. Um, I don't know whether I'll keep to the title very closely. I have a habit of wandering off topic, but it seemed to be a one that Trevor was happy with. So you're you're partly to blame if I don't uh, if I don't meet the the brief, Trevor. Um, in uh, towards 2000, the Welsh Marxist uh, Raymond Williams made his final attempt to map the challenges he expected that industrial societies would face as they approached the new millennium. Um, although he did not live to see how accurate his forecasts were, uh, the book was published in 1983, Williams died uh, five years later. Um, the book ends on an optimistic note, quote, once the inevitabilities are challenged, we begin gathering our resources for a journey of hope. Well, this talk I'm going to give tonight accepts Williams' challenge by questioning the inevitabilities and examining some of those resources, old and new, uh, to see whether the intellectual, uh, an intellectual self-defense can be built against some of the urgent challenges that humanity confronts today. The problems are grave and they reach every domain of life, from families to international politics. They include the epidemic of depression, perpetual economic crises, a progressive destruction of the planet's life support systems, and the proliferation of destructive military technologies which threatened to bring nature's only experiment with higher intelligence to a sudden unpleasant conclusion. I'm primarily concerned here with intellectual perspectives and approaches that make progress towards an attenuation of these dangers more likely, or at least possible. I cannot propose solutions, but I think it is possible to identify and remove some of the barriers which prevent us from continuing the human experiment towards the next millennium. Now, in his recent reflections on critical social theory, the distinguished historian Gabriel Kolko identified the problem in concise, if more pessimistic terms than Raymond Williams. This was uh, from the first page of, of uh, Kolko's book. Uh, we live in an age when exhausted analytical concepts, devoid of prerequisites for coping with daily realities, still s hold sway over our minds. Conventional wisdoms, whether from the ideological and political right, the centre or left are deductive academic abstractions that fail to explain the increasingly grave problems we confront both at home and internationally. Inherited ideas still burden us with illusions and have not anticipated the main upheavals of our time and far greater clarity is necessary is a necessary precondition essential but scarcely sufficient for controlling our destiny. Kolko was bemoaning the analytic shambles of the humanities and social sciences, which happens to be the title of the school that I belong to, which he criticised for being incapable of even articulating an accurate or useful vision of the present, let alone offering any predictive value for those seeking to understand the future. Specifically, the humanities and social sciences had failed to produce a conceptual framework for assessing the times we are living through, much less the means necessary for reversing a course that set for economic crises and more destructive wars. He is, in my view, right. Too many theorists have allowed their desires to define their ideas. Instead of rational intelligence and reason, 
they've stubbornly refused to acknowledge either their sheer ignorance or even the limits of their knowledge about the world. In their desire for certainty and universal answers, they have mistakenly viewed the past, present and future as a coherent whole, a grand narrative in the long durée. As Kolko writes, no grand theory of any sort, religious or secular, has survived the ravages of human experience in an immensely complicated world which has undermined all highly structured propositions regarding the future of societies. Theories and the assumptions that they embody rarely accord with social realities and they become in most instances articles of faith. Well, human beings being what they are, they will always continue to seek what they know that they cannot find, certainty about what the future holds for them. They will pursue this endeavour through organised religion, new age mysticism, and more serious academic disciplines such as economics, international relations and sociology. Knowledge that the whole exercise is futile seems to be in no way discouraging to those who embark on this quest, in fact quite the opposite. It remains very difficult for humans to acknowledge that there are no, th th sorry, that there are absolute limits to what they can comprehend about themselves and their world. In understanding the nature of free will, to take just one perplexing feature of the human condition, little or no progress has been made over four centuries of serious intellectual effort. Still newer fields of academic study, such as evolutionary psychology and behavioural economics, also strive to discover the unknowable and rapidly develop a loyal and enthusiastic following despite modest research outcomes. Religion and spirituality, which wax and wane in popularity across the Western world, reflect an inability or reluctance to accept reality and an insatiable hope for something better than our bare material existence. They're often expressions of insecurity, responses to cultural bullying or forms of escapism. But they, are also, but they are also a desire for certainty about the past, but more so the future. In some circumstances, belief systems of this kind provide short-term comfort, though they remain forms of false consciousness. And self-delusion can have a disastrous consequence. Faith, after all, demands that we suspend our rational faculties and accept many remarkable claims as given and beyond evaluation or even questioning. Marx's reference to the opium of the people is one of his best known aphorisms. But if we read the next few lines in the introduction to his contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, he gets to both the heart of the problem and on the path to a solution. Quote, religion is only the illusory sun which revolves around man as long as he does not revolve around himself. Well, over 160 years after these words were written, they seem strangely discordant in a world which increasingly regards anthropocentrism with suspicion. The challenge nevertheless remains. Humankind has not yet learnt to revolve around itself. Until it does, its most serious problems will remain. Psychology, uh, the inward turn as Peter Singer evocatively calls it, remains attractive to those who want to self-medicate. By pathologising their own unhappiness, the promise of a cure and some relief from the miseries of life seem close to hand. However, as an explanation of human behaviour generally, psychology is a taxonomy of stories which document the infin infinite variety of human behaviour, but little else. Therapy can help many of us, and can, as can an empathetic, untrained listener. But I think Noam Chomsky is right when he says there are simply too many variables involved in understanding human beings for the brain to ever truly comprehend something we call human nature with any certainty. Not to mention the difficulty of conducting the kind of controlled experiments that might yield scientifically credible answers. Behavioural science, therefore, seems somewhat oxymoronic. Attractive as a guarantee of greater self-understanding, but ultimately disappointing in delivering on such a promise. So, how can the institutions of higher learning assist us to mount an intellectual self-defence against the immiseration of modern life? If not spirituality, religion or psychology, what resources of hope do exist? <laughs>
<clears throat> if universities took notice of what much of the business community said about preparing graduates for gainful employment, they would simply run courses in conformity and obedience for the wage slaves to be. Wiser corporate heads appreciate the value of critical, independent and creative thinking, but it is far from the consensus view. Too many employers are looking for that original Orwellian concept of drones. In part as a consequence, there are too many power-sucking pseudo-intellectuals, to quote Christopher Hitchens, whose conformist subservience to those in power seems in as instinctive as it is servile. Just look at their reactions to WikiLeaks in both the mainstream media and the political establishment. Nothing less than hysteria at the thought of greater transparency in the political world. It would, in my view, be a monumental failure for universities in responding to community needs to succumb to market demands like these. In the arts and humanities, we must not teach students what to think or what to do, but it would be a dereliction of our duty if we didn't teach them how to think for themselves. This responsibility is a necessary prerequisite to overcome alienation and estrangement that human beings experience at both the individual and social levels whether it be attempts to commodify our emotions or find illusory comfort in our kingdoms of gold. Breaking free of frameworks of thinkable thought and limited spectrums of permitted expression is a mo is in modern liberal democracies is a crucial first step for those who want to understand today's complex world. Our minds need to be sensitive to spin, propaganda, ideology and indoctrination. We should never uncritically accept the official worldview of events promoted by governments or establishment media, especially when counter-narratives are more freely available than ever before. Despite occasional cracks in the monolith, combating state-sponsored orthodoxies is not easy. This is partly because of the mainstream media's clamour for instant, brief and incontrovertible answers to questions about baffling and unforeseen events. Dissenting views which draw on historical context can be easily crowded out by the tyranny of concision, which dominates even online media. There is also the challenge of being overwhelmed by complex events themselves, and the difficulty of getting intellectual and emotional distance from where considered judgment might be made. A starting point where some intellectual bearings can be found is to be wary of the parochialism of the present a tendency to grossly exaggerate the historical significance of dramatic contemporary events. When we are swept up in the emotion and drama of visually powerful images such as the 9-11 attacks, it is easy to believe that we are experiencing a phenomenon never before confronted by the human species. This may in turn lead to the acceptance of more extreme political responses that would normally be considered unethical and intolerable. In the mid-1950s, when the formal study of international relations was in its adolescence, its most influential British thinker argued that one of the main purposes of university education is to escape the zeitgeist from the mean, narrow, provincial spirit which is constantly assuring us that we are at the peak of human achievement, that we stand on the edge of unprecedented prosperity or unparalleled catastrophe. In an injunction as apposite today as it was when it was made during the Cold War, Martin White argued that it is a liberation of the spirit to acquire perspective, to recognise that every generation is confronted by problems of the utmost subjective urgency, and that an objective grading is probably impossible, to learn that the same moral predicaments and the same ideas have been explored before. White was warning us against the parochialism of the present. When events such as September the 11th, 2001, the, the terrorist attacks on those days were said to have changed everything and that the world will never be the same, I'm quoting Prime Minister Howard, White's remarks are a reminder that such declarations rarely withstand scrutiny. It, it is important to subject such claims to critical evaluation and in White's phrase, explore ways of escaping a zeitgeist which has become the pretext for implementing a range of disturbing changes to domestic and international politics. As the late Fred Halliday noted in response to this specific example, it is easy and portentous to say, as many have, that everything has changed since 11th of September. This is, however, a proposition that is as hard to disprove as, as it is hard to prove. 
Even the most cataclysmic of events can lead to exaggeration. The world did not change, the sun did not darken, the novel hope or happiness did not die after Auschwitz, the Gulag, Sabran, Shatila, Sarajevo, Rwanda. The world learnt something, or at least some of it did. As a result, some things, not least the political systems, the histories, the cultures, the hopes and fears of mankind continued. The same will be true of the 11th of September 2001. Well, the political fallout from 9-11 changed life in many liberal democracies. Uh, draconian powers of surveillance and detention were handed to security agencies at the expense of the civil liberties of citizens. There was a change in strategic posture from deterrence to preemption in the US, attempts to rewrite international law to legitimise such a doctrinal shift, and an attack on the sovereign independence of states, which was said to pose a present or future threat. Well, how can we acquire perspective in such an environment and recognise that the same moral predicaments and the same ideas have been explored before when we've apparently entered a new era where old established guidelines no longer apply? When governments deploy their considerable resources to a public relations campaign based on the message everything has changed, those looking for alternative explanations are immediately placed on the back foot. It can be quite a challenge, even for those whose vocation is the strategic analysis of events such as the 9-11 attacks. Seeking to understand the causes of the attacks can be portrayed as condoning them, and in the case of 9-11, it was. The alternative to this task, however, is mental paralysis, which effectively gives government a free hand. As the American sociologist C. Wright Mills wrote during the dramatic days of the Second World War, when events move very fast and possible worlds swing around them, something happens to the quality of thinking. Some men repeat formula, some men become reporters. To time observation with thought so as to mate a decent level of abstraction with crucial happenings is a difficult problem. It's not a problem which only specialists can solve. According to White, one need read very little in political theory to become aware of recurrence and repetition. True enough, at least for those willing to examine current events in light of, the, of their antecedents. He could have added that knowledge of history is both a powerful rebuttal to the view that the world confronted an unprecedented crisis after 9-11 and a vital step in the successful prevention of future threats. Overemphasizing the importance of current events and uh, actors, the parochialism of the present, or presentism, as is now often called, may be more common today because of modern media and reporting techniques, but it is a profoundly ahistorical exercise. As two academics have suggested, it is a process which reverses the dictum about using the past to understand the present. It concentrates on short-term horizons and current affairs as if they were not part of a broader long durée, as the French annals historian Ferdinand Braudel described, showing slow-moving and barely perceptible developments in history. This is particularly the case in the analysis of dramatic high-profile events like 9-11, which grab a great deal of media attention. The antidote to presentism requires historical and theoretical knowledge as, as, as well as thoughtful and considered judgment. Analysis of dramatic contemporary events should embrace historical narratives with an eye to uncovering distinct patterns and themes which can uh, illuminate the present. They should provide historical context to ensure that the analysis of apparently unique events takes account of established historical relationships and connections. This cannot be done in electronic sound bites or 700 word op-ed articles in newspapers. It is done, or at least attempted, in fields such as mine, the theories of international relations. Gabriel Kolko highlights the challenge of understanding dramatic events such as 9-11 or the Arab Spring in US foreign policy. Quote, it's understandable that intelligent people should be preoccupied with the events reported in the daily press, but they are most comprehensible in their historical context. It is far more risky to focus on particulars as if they have no precedence or are not part of an older, longer pattern. Indeed, a major fault of many assessments of US foreign policy 
is precisely such a disregard for the meaning of its conduct and the circumstances that led to them. US foreign policy is a whole cloth and can be understood adequate, adequately only in its historical framework. Random, seemingly inexplicable events are more shocking than those which are the culmination of longer recognised patterns over time. We receive no warnings about them. However, it is rare for events to have no historical context of any kind which can be used to explain or understand them, to say nothing of the perpetual desire for using the past and the present to predict the future. There are, however, two dangers to be aware of when assuming that an historical narrative always exists behind dramatic contemporary events. The first is the danger of dismissing even the possibility of unique events. The second is the human need for a linear narrative, whether or not one actually exists. In his introduction to Martin White's remarks about the need to escape the zeitgeist and get some historical perspective on contemporary international events, the Australian international relations specialist Hedley Bull, who was arguably White's greatest champion, warns us not to assume that new or unprecedented events cannot occur. Bull asks, is there not a danger in following these injunctions that when confronted by some genuinely unprecedented situation, we may fail to recognise it? Does not world politics in the 20th century reflect developments, too obvious to enumerate, which it is correct to regard as without precedent? And it is not a, de it's not a delusion to imagine that these developments can be understood by seeking out of historical parallels rather than by immersing ourselves in the study of what is recent and new in all its individuality. If presentism involves imposing the present on the past, historicism, its polar opposite, imposes the past on the present. The latter may be less problematic than the former, however the uncritical acceptance of historical or root causes for every contemporary event is, is potentially just as corrupting in its influence on our understanding. No two historical parallels are ever exact. There are always variations and uncertainty. There is always contingency. And human beings do not like contingency. They crave certainty. The point here is not to dismiss historical precedents, which are often invaluable tools and contexts for understanding and explaining dramatic events. It's a warning against assuming that every event has an explicable historical chronology, the so-called hindsight bias. There are important parallels between the Great Depression, which began in the late 1920s, and the global financial crisis, which erupted in 2007. The former, however, does not explain the latter. In fact, it helps us to understand very little. Exactly the same can be said about the Vietnam War, which began in the mid-1960s, and the war in Iraq in 2003. Both were sparked by politically manipulated or fabricated intelligence, in the case of Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, in the case of Iraq, non-existent weapons of mass destruction. But one could not have predicted the latter simply by examining the former. Human beings are often, uh, often display a desire for what is termed the narrative fallacy, a need to place an event into a series of connected historical facts, regardless of whether such a fit can actually be made. We feel more comfortable with the idea of linear progression than we do with chaos, randomness and happenstance. An unexpected event which is seemingly inexplicable and has no obvious historical antecedents is very threatening. According to Nassim Talib, a highly improbable event, which he terms a black swan, has three principal characteristics. It is unpredictable, it carries a massive impact and after the fact, we concoct an explanation that makes it appear less random and more predictable than it actually was. Rarity, extreme impact, and retrospective predictability. Examples of black swans might include 9-11, the success of Google, the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union, the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, the global financial crisis, and the Arab Spring. It is our tendency to concoct narrative fallacies after the fact, in order to make an event explainable and retrospectively predictable, sometimes called the confirmation bias, which we must also consider when analysing global economic systems. The search for regularities, patterns and cycles 
reassures us that nothing is ever completely new. Things will eventually return to normal because the system is self-correcting and we've been through crises of, these, of this kind before. The problem here is that we may be imposing this narrative on unique events simply to make us feel better about them or to pretend that we're ultimately in control of them. There may in fact be no basis for such confidence. It might be nothing more than wishful thinking and yet this tendency is at the basis of most financial advice and forecasting. Responses to economic decline, such as the global financial crisis, which began in 2007, illustrates the point. Claims about economic cycles and market corrections are reassuring because they imply that the integrity of the system is not in question and that within it there are self-correcting, fail-safe mechanisms which will inevitably lead back to stability and economic growth. The economic system is, by presupposition, inherently rational and therefore manageable. These assumptions are not up for debate. According to Kolko, this assumes that there is a higher capitalist intelligence, a logic that defines events, and not merely a will to attain rational control, but the ability to do so. If confidence in the system is to be maintained, it is necessary to believe that someone, somewhere, is directing the course of events. They may mismanage the economy or fail to respond correctly to its demands, but the logical integrity of the system is never at issue. However, as Kolko argues, it is a mistake to postulate a coherence and rationality to the existing system, uh, e existing economy and social system, which assumes it is deliberately integrated and viable so that a functionalist vision of it emerges. This is because as tempting and reassuring as grand models and structural explanations are, they fail to take account of variables which are endemic to human behaviour. It's about as futile as trying to rationally manage one's emotional life, as if we can plan to fall in love and enter the date in our calendars. Not everything fits or can be explained. Our understanding of how modern complex capitalist economies actually function is much more limited than we care to acknowledge. Avarice, failures of omission and commission, stupidity, incompetence, inadequate intelligence, happenstance, accident, complexity, ambition and much else erode the integrative functions of the ruling system and those who guide it. Consequently, crises are neither predictable nor adequately explained. Black swans, for example, cannot be factored into policy considerations even though we may fool ourselves with illusions such as the alleged metrics of risk management or Joseph Schumpeter's notion of creative destruction. The narrative illusion of a linear, stable, self-correcting economy cannot permit a serious consideration that the system might in fact be anarchic and chaotic, let alone an admission that we might not even know how it works. Admitting this would cast doubt on its very legitimacy so it can't happen. Despite this, economics as a study of human behaviour remains enthralled with 19th century zeitgeists which confuse the economists' benign predictions for the way people should behave with what they actually do, as if men and women's motivations are utterly calculable and immune to greed, group influence or illusions and ignorance. If this component of the narrative fallacy wasn't disturbing enough, these same theorists proceed to ignore the crucial agency of ambitious politicians and the role of the state in their formulations, despite contrary evidence from economic historians. The longevity of these intellectual inheritances owes more to ideology and class interests than it does to insight and understanding. The absence of contingency or doubt in a religion is regarded as a strength of faith and in a secular theory, the same may enhance a discipline's reputation for abstract elegance. However, it was also highlights the inadequacy of such an approach as a conceptual framework for understanding how, in this case, modern capitalism actually operates. There are simply too many unknowns, or in Donald Rumsfeld's famous phrase, unknown unknowns. Human motivations and behaviour are, are inconsistent, often contradictory, and frequently too opaque to be accurately mapped. Similarly, assumptions about progress in the human condition, which cannot be measured, let alone confirmed, may be reassuring but also lead to an illusion of predictability. 
Human beings want to know what the future holds for them and are attracted to promises of fortune telling no matter how bizarre, even though they don't believe that it's actually possible. Despite all the evidence of our utter failure to predict future events, we remain resolutely determined to keep trying. Kremlinologists failed to anticipate the fall of the Berlin Wall. Terrorologists didn't notice Al-Qaeda and Middle East experts were surprised by the Arab Spring. Both major intellectual traditions which emerged from the European Enlightenment, liberalism and Marxism, presuppose progress in the human condition and to a certain extent claim a capacity to predict how the future will unfold. Surprisingly, the ongoing failure of predictive social science, even to anticipate major upheavals such as wars, the collapse of communism, the rise of Islamist terror, the global financial crisis, has not led to a fundamental reconsideration of goals and performance in these disciplines. The lesson here is clear. Only the past is predictable, not the future. And as Tolstoy said, history would be an excellent thing if only it were true. Despite its association with totalitarian societies of the left and right, <coughs> indoctrination is also a common feature of societies that describe themselves as free. Those, were the co those where coercive powers of the state are weakest and the population cannot be easily controlled by violence and fear. Although since the 1930s it has been primarily understood in pejorative terms, not all indoctrination should be seen as malignant. It underwrites every faith-based belief system, including all monotheistic religions. It is the primary means for the transmission of values from one generation to the next and it would be difficult to imagine any ed educational curriculum or parental advice to young children without propaganda of some kind featuring extensively. Indoctrination is particularly prevalent in minority and persecuted cultures, especially amongst first generation migrants, because it is seen as an essential tool for maintaining social cohesion, integrity and ultimately group identity. In establishing traditions which must be followed, or taboos which must be avoided, indoctrination first erects, then patrols the intellectual boundaries within which legitimate thoughts can be freely expressed. These boundaries are tightly prescribed, but they must remain largely invisible if they are to be effective and remain unchallenged. As Milan Ray argues, we can no longer perceive the ideas that are shaping our thoughts as the fish cannot perceive the sea. Debate and discussion occurs, but within strictly controlled limits that may not be widely recognised. In this way, a degree of ideological control is achieved in free societies, not by threats or intimidation, but by defining the spectrum of permitted thought, a voluntary rather than a coercive constraint, but no less effective. Control is achieved by removing contestable ideas from the contest of ideas, making them instead presuppositions whose acceptance is actually a prerequisite for discourse about a particular subject. Making an idea implicit tends to protect it from being challenged or opposed. By, making constantly, by being constantly reinforced, the ideas come to be accepted as part of the framework necessary to even start a discussion. Paradoxically, this is easier in open societies which champion free speech and permit vigorous debates and discussion said to be the lifeblood of all liberal democracies. In truth, much of what is defined as dissent in these societies is in fact feigned and confined to the mainstream, which almost by definition is the only location where serious ideas can be found. On some topics, the spectrum of legitimate thought is very narrow indeed. One recent example is the aftermath of the GFC, the global financial crisis. Policy responses to the crisis in the US centered on how to stabilize or reform the global financial system, but within strictly controlled limits which largely preserved the status quo. Exorbitant fees, regardless of company share price or the performance of bankers, generous bonuses unrelated to share price or bank performance, innovative complexity of financial instruments, and most importantly, minimal regulation of the sector. The challenge was to make the existing system work better rather than replace it with something less volatile and dangerous or more just and humane. As a con consequence of a concerted mobilisation by the business class, 
or what would be called class warfare if it was conducted by unions, and President Obama's indebtedness to the finance community for funding his election campaigns, even minor proposals for, wholes uh, even minor proposals for long overdue reform were aborted. Despite a window of opportunity for wholesale reform at the height of the crisis, serious attempts at structural change were not even considered. An elite consensus of preserving the privileges of the status quo prevailed over the interests of the general population. Consequently, the crisis will almost certainly be reprised, though for much of Europe it is barely moderated. This, could, this outcome could not have occurred without the lowering of public expectations and propaganda which sought to limit any changes to the margins of the current system. It was presupposed that the existing financial system was the best that could be hoped for, and permitted policy discussion was confined to proposals which would not inhibit its workings in any meaningful way. Extraordinary disparities of wealth and income, or the contrasting fortunes of bankers and pension holders, were seen as epiphenomenal. This is because it is vital that the system is seen as broadly legitimate even by those who have least to gain from it. From the perspective of the bankers who launched an offensive against regulation, the campaign was a total success. We are no better prepared for the inevitable next financial crisis today than we were five years ago. Or to put it in terms that the people of Southern Europe would understand today, you are going to pay for the self-regulation of the financial sector with even harsher austerity. Indoctrination and propaganda train us for obedience and conformity. They discourage us from thinking differently or creatively, particularly in dealing with new problems and challenges we face every day. Instead, they provide ready-made, pre-prepared answers, so we really don't have to think at all. They attempt to constrain our possible futures by lim limiting our possible thoughts. The first step in countering indoctrination or propaganda to break William Blake's uh, mind-forged manacles and to constructing a long-term antidote to its onslaught is to understand its purposes, specifically why it exists and what it is seeking to achieve. This will not be sufficient to, this will not be sufficient to mount a proper defence, but is a necessary starting point. For minority groups, even those in tolerant multicultural settings, preserving group identity, customs, traditions, histories, can only be achieved by indoctrinating each new generation. Propaganda and indoctrination are needed because exposing many of these cultural practices to critical rational evaluation would only lead to ridicule, schisms and possibly the dissolution of the group. This can't be allowed to occur, but it reveals to us that indoctrination is a weapon of the weak who lack the confidence to transmit their ideas in a reasoned way without manipulating their target audience. The means by which specific values are transmitted from generation to generation, the types of indoctrination and propaganda can take several forms. Here are just a few. Uh, religious edicts, such as bans on homosexuality and birth control. Obedience to and conformity with group values, marrying within the tribe. Prohibitions on challenging parental authority, mother knows best. Rigid enforcement of social roles, dutiful wife, daughter or mother. Mythology and orthodoxy, only one narrative of origins is legitimate. And educational systems, reproduction of private school class values. In combination, these can be very effective in limiting horizons and available choices, often benignly described as setting one's goals, where legal enforcement and threats of violence are simply not available. Aspects of them exist in all subcultures, and the only people who ever fully escape their grip are sociopaths. Importantly, you cannot have an action without a preceding idea. So if actions are difficult to control, ideas will be considered the easier target. You cannot build the institutions of democracy without first conceptualising freedom and liberty. Unsurprisingly, totalitarian regimes of the left and right sought to quell dissent by making it difficult and painful to imagine, let alone practice. Imposing feelings of guilt and betrayal are highly effective mechanisms for maintaining social discipline while punishing dissidents, troublemakers and iconoclasts. This is structural power as opposed to relational power. 
and usually more effective in maintaining rigid control. Structural power is the capacity to shape and determine the policy or emotional environment within which people must think and make decisions, framing the terms in which problems and challenges can be articulated and addressed. And as Chomsky notes, it is only in folk tales, children's stories and journals of intellectual opinion that power is used wisely to destroy evil. Breaking free from these structures can be very difficult and costly and it is rarely a one-off event. It must be done repeatedly and continuously. Most people either balk at the psychological angst it generates, especially within families, or give up halfway through because it is much easier to surrender. Little gratitude is expressed for breaking ranks and forging a unique path. In families, power plays and psychological battles are often designed to convince potential outriders that the price of dissent is simply too high. Being ostracised, surveilled and criticised is rarely much fun. But from those closest friends and family, it can be personally devastating. Conformity with existing norms and obedience to higher ranks within the family, on the other hand, are encouraged as normal and natural and frequently rewarded. It requires resilience and considerable self-confidence to buck the system, to stand up for one's own principles, regardless of how unpopular they may be and where the adverse consequences of one's actions. Ultimately, it may come down to self-image. Do I respect myself? And do I really care what others think about me? The consequentialist philosophers are right. We are all responsible for the predictable consequences of our actions, including our failure to act in certain circumstances. This is a responsibility that extends to the policy choices of our governments to the extent that we can meaningfully participate in policy formation. There is no escaping this, regardless of modern allergies to personal responsibility for the actions of individuals. So how can the best path be navigated to meet challenges of this kind at a personal level. Philosophical anarchists assert that all authority, unless justified, is inherently illegitimate and that the burden of proof is on those in authority to justify their role. If this burden cannot be met, the authority in question should be dismantled, whether it be political, employment or family authority. Authority for its own sake is inherently unjustified. Challenging authority and discarding conventional wisdom, on the other hand, are vital prerequisites to all forms of human creativity. Legitimate authority does exist and should be exerted. A simple example would be an adult who prevents a young child from wandering into road traffic. But most author mostly, authority is not justified and exists only to maintain unequal power relations and privileges. In these circumstances, it should be destroyed. To reiterate the point, if the authority cannot justify itself, it has no legitimacy. Now children are normally much better at understanding this because they have had less exposure to concentrated efforts to indoctrinate them, at least until they reach puberty. Those kids who refuse to conform or obey are often said to have behavioural problems. When most have no such thing, they are probably just bored or simply refuse to be unquestioning in the presence of their elders. The education system for children is particularly effective at weeding these people out. Too often it teaches people what to think and not how to think. That's a good working definition of indoctrination. Those few who survive the filtering processes are then dismissed as mavericks, non-conformists, surely a badge of honour rather than a pejorative term, or radicals. They can be safely ignored or used to reinforce the wisdom of the majority in the responsible middle. Freedom alone or the idea of freedom is not by itself sufficient. The means to realise it must also be there. As Noam Chomsky said in relation to the challenges faced by the people of South Africa in the post-apartheid era, freedom without opportunity is a devil's gift and a refusal to provide such opportunities is criminal. If humans do have an instinct for freedom as the defining aspect of their nature, Training people for obedience and conformity is as difficult as it is unnatural. 
Propaganda messages are therefore employed to redraw the boundaries of legitimate thought, permitting only a narrow spectrum of ideas and consequent practices. Here are some familiar ones designed to reinforce the futility of taking an aberrant or idiosyncratic path. No one is really happy, so what makes you think you're special? Stop dreaming and get your head out of the clouds. Don't be a hopeless romantic, the real world isn't like that. Don't swim against the tide, it's a waste of time and effort. You have responsibilities now. Accept your lot and be grateful for what you have. There are many worse off than you. Just get on with it. Sound familiar? Well, in my view, these injunctions are little more than expressions of an ideology which provides the status quo with a moral patina. It doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to settle for being comfortably numb. We can be as radical as reality and, as the anarchists implore us to do, demand the impossible. This seems to be the shortest path to constructing an intellectual self-defence against the challenges of modern life. Conformity defies the limitless possibilities of human development and it is the ultimate crime against reality. Rebelling for the sake of rebelling is pointless and infantile. Rebelling to understand the real meaning of freedom and explore one's true potential, inspired by the hope of a better future and the pursuit of resources for a journey of hope, is something very different. It is much more than a moral consolation and should be an obligation on all of us. Thanks. Thank you, you've, um, you've ranged over. Uh, a lot of topics and I think you've been uh, provocative and uh, I particularly was taken by the phrase the parochialism of the present and the, uh, and the notion that there's no greater crisis than the one that we have at the moment as a massive conceit uh, that was my reading of what you said I want to uh, be able to uh, open the floor to questions and, uh, and we'll keep dealing with questions until Scott tells us to stop or um, they turn the lights off. Thanks very much for an excellent talk. I was wondering how much do you think this uh, history is, um, can be explained in terms of um, you know, unified theories and themes that you'll pick up from, from the history books? And how much of it is simply just happenstance and randomness and uh, um, an accident? So, uh, you know, a, a Marxist might say, look, um, the class struggle drives uh, history and, and, and others would have different lenses in which they view the past. Um, and on the surface it might seem, you know, you get 50%, 80% and the rest you might say is just is the random tale. But, uh, do you want to conjecture as to how much theories can explain it and how much is beyond uh, the limits of the knowledge? Yeah. Look, um, when I teach theories of international relations, I kind of present it like a smorgasbord, one of those all-you-can-eat places that you see on the highway down at Geelong, um, because you're never going to be satisfied with one course. It's always something else uh, that you need to, to bite into. And students find that extremely just um, unsettling initially because they want certainty, they want one theory that answers all their problems and if you don't give it that there's some crisis of confidence whereas if you I try to explain that um, you won't be satisfied with one approach which will explain all the, the complex myriad events in global politics you might need Marxism to explain globalization but you might need realism to explain power you might need liberalism to explain democracy and human rights and you've just got to live with that level of contingency and generality it's, there's no uh, alternative but the most disturbing thing, and the thing, first thing that came to mind when you asked the question, is just the collapse of the study of history in schools and therefore universities. Uh, the numbers have just dropped off dramatically. And uh, that is a concern because, as you can imagine from what I said, uh, there's a basic level of historical understanding that is a prerequisite for dealing with some of these issues. And if no one's studying any history because it's not fashionable or haven't got time or they're doing something more technologically focused, um, then we're going to lose even more uh, of that background understanding. Um, so that's the, my great concern at the moment, just the number of students who, um, who are studying history has collapsed. And I presume, it's, I know it's Victoria, but it's, uh, it's, I think it's a global or Australian problem anyway. Hi. 
Today in the Age, there was an article saying that people might be disposed towards being empathetic or evil because of hormones in their body that they had no control over. And you mentioned something also about sociopaths, and, mm. and you made it sound desirable because they had uh, escaped the conformity. <laughs> I'm just wondering, with all these sort of random thoughts I've got about that, how, how do they tie in for you? I mean, should is there any possibility of really thinking freely if we're... Um, controlled by our genetics? Uh, well, I wouldn't. I would very argue very strongly that we, um, uh, as a species, have um, one distinct, at least one distinct characteristic, and that's the ability to defy our biological programming and our endowment. Also, worry about those biological explanations for behaviour. Um, I know I'm going to tread on a minefield here when I talk about um, premenstrual tension, <laughs> okay, as a um, uh, as a chemical explanation for behavioural change. Uh, and the reason, when I, whenever I'm a, a party, or anyone ever says, you know, you've got to excuse me because I'm, for whatever reason it's, I'm going through a bad time of the month, <laughs> it all, the first thing that occurs to me is I just wish you wouldn't use that argument because it's the same one that um, rapists could use for testosterone. But do you think that testosterone being ironic, they're just kind of flirting with you and being ironic? No, no one ever flirts with me, so it's <laughs> <that's> not, <laughs> certainly not the case, no. It's, um, but I just, it worries me that if we, we uh, it's a determinist argument, of course, by saying, you know, well, I'd like to be a decent host or a decent human being, but, you know, the chemistry is all cra crazy <laughs> at the moment, so you just have to make allowances. The worry for me is not so much that, it's the, on the male side, for a male to say, well, you know, I, you know, I didn't want to, you know, multiple sexual partners, but I just got this testosterone flowing around, there's nothing I can do about it, you know, so... <laughs> let me off, you know. Um, I don't think either argument's a really good one to use, but I can understand how and why it's popular. Uh, so I didn't want to make psychopaths appear to be uh, attractive. Um, in my experience, and universities, of course, are replete with them. Um, it's almost a prerequisite for employment at a university these days, and if you haven't a psychopath at the start, you are certainly are after you get to <laughs> 10 years of service. Um, that's, um, mm, you know, you just don't want to make friends with a psychopath. And uh, I, I just, I only use that example to show that they're probably the only people who are completely immune from the influences of decent morality. But one other point I'd like to make about that is that <clears throat> I do believe that there's um, decency is the underwriting, under, underwritten um, moral DNA in us, if that's possible, if, if it doesn't, it's a clumsy way of expressing it. But just means that human beings rarely um, exhibit behaviour, antisocial behaviour, without trying to um, justify it in ethical terms. Um, one of the examples Chomsky uses is the, is the Nazis who never said it was fun to exterminate Jews. They said we were doing it to purify the Aryan race. In other words, there's a sort of presupposition there that something had to be justified. That to me is very reassuring. That you just don't, you just don't behave in a way, and then say it was fun to do the you know, evil acts. That you've got to come up with some preposterous ethical or moral dis, you know, defence of what you were doing. That suggests to me that even within the heart of evil and the most disgraceful and disgusting human beings, there is actually an inherent moral disposition that has either been suppressed or denied in some cases, but it's there. And um, so that gives me some hope that uh, um, it's not a, such a you know, disparaging and uh, sort of disappointing, depressing outcome. And then I'll jump in there because early on uh, in your piece you, you, you gave a little swipe at evolutionary psychology. Uh, now, I'm no fan of evolutionary psychology. Uh, indeed, I'm probably less of a fan of evolutionary psychology than you are. Uh, but I know that the evolutionary psychologists get very fond of things like the evolution of morals. Mm. But they tend to give it a certain kind of economism. Mm. There was a good purpose. There, there was, it served a purpose to be moral. Uh, yep. Yep. What do you think of that? Well, look, I think there's a strong argument that you can make about moral progress. For example, um, it wasn't that long ago that uh, if two men in, the, in aristocratic circles um, sought the affections of the same woman, they would resolve it at ten paces with extremely inaccurate firearms 
which would then shoot at each other, rendering them both extremely unattractive uh, <laughs> to the suitor, um, and blow bits off. Now, we don't do duelling anymore, as far as I'm aware, anyway, in any modern society, and that's progress. Just as uh, slavery is now a, um, regarded as morally unacceptable, though it does exist in certain parts of Africa still. But no one puts up a moral defence of apartheid. No one puts up a moral um, defence of slavery or, or duelling. And I hope at some point that warfare will go the same way as most liberals do. But uh, the point about evolutionary psychology was really that we haven't made, where we haven't made progress is in understanding the notion of free will, for example. Um, and the reason may just simply be that we don't have the intellectual tools to do it. But you know, this just people have written lots about it and thought about it, but in terms of greater understanding about what free will is, where it comes from, you know, how, why it exists, um, nothing's really uh, changed since Descartes. And uh, the reason may just simply be that we don't have the means to understand it and we have to accept the limits of our understanding and our knowledge, which is a very hard thing for human beings to, to ever do. To mm. Mm. I'm just wondering if you have a, a visual, visualization of human utopia and what is it? Um, that's like a, that's, a, that's what I used to call a quicksand question, <laughs> which you get into and you never get out of. Um, well, I think, um, and this is not, this is always a bit of an unaccept unacceptable answer, but a, a genuinely free society is one where people can explore their potential without limitation, or without constraint. And for, that will be different for every person. You can't have a formula that works in every case. Some people want reassurance, they want some guidelines, they want to live their life according to a particular moral code, and that's meaningful to them and they should be allowed to do that. So to portray my idea of a free society to them may have, in fact alienate them entirely. I think it's just get, it's, it comes down to ultimately the ability to choose the path that you want for yourself without constraint, without alienation, without estrangement. And, uh, that's about as close to utopia as we, we can get. Uh, but it's interesting that um, you know, even the, the, the person in my field, in international relations, which is most closely associated with realism, that's E.H. Carr, uh, ends his, his famous book, The 30 Years, uh, the 20 Years Crisis, with uh, the saying that you know, reality uh, without some degree of idealism is never going to work. So there's got to be a mixture of both. And uh, if you don't have some vision of where you're heading, if you don't have some vision of how to improve the human condition, then you'll never make any progress. I mean, the best way of limit, the best way of stopping people from making progress is not to stop them physically, but to dishearten them or give them the impression that there is no hope, so you don't bother trying. Um, so I, you know, my, I think we're intellectual. The role for intellectuals is to ex explain and show that there are paths to progress in some of these areas. You know, I didn't mention one of the other examples of the, extraordinary, the revolution in the role of women in Western societies in the last hundred years. It could be nothing less than a revolution. Um, that's progress in my view, but it may not be viewed always as in that way. Um, so progress is possible, progress is being made, you just got to, um, if you're one of the glass half full types rather than the glass half, glass half empty types, you've got to just keep emphasising that progress is possible but it's slow. And you've got to constantly be on the alert for slippage and falling back into bad habits. Um, that's the, the obligation on inte intellectuals of some kind, I think. But I don't have, unfortunately, any more detailed versions of utopia than that, and uh, uh, that's probably an indication of my limitations than anything else. Do you have any comments about the climate change debate, with, which really throws up this idea of the limits to our, our knowledge? Uh, there are theories out there. Uh, on the other hand, there's a constraint that uh, if we wait for the time for all the theories to come in and gather all the evidence, maybe it's too late because uh, the, the lag in terms of slowing down our, our um, emissions mm -hmm. and the effects that, for that to um, uh, improve the climate. Well, I, you know, I, I think to, just a uh, very brief comment. There are two types of ways of viewing this, There's of opposition to climate change. The scientific opposition, which needs to be considered seriously, uh, if, there are if there are scientists who have genuine arguments, they need to be considered. But they need to be distinguished from political opposition to climate change, which is motivated by an entirely different set of assumptions and, and arguments and ideas. And I think we've conflated both. So now the debate in Australia about climate change 
fails to make that distinction between you know, the scientific arguments and political ar uh, arguments. And the, the best way of ge getting through that debate, I think, is to re-separate those issues. You can debate one and debate the other, but to mix them together, I think, poisons the entire, and uh, deliberately poisons the entire argument. So people are left in a kind of bemused, confused way, not knowing really what the answers would be. Um, I don't know of any other area of scientific uh, development where uh, politics has poisoned the uh, atmosphere in the same way, to coin a pun, but uh, it has in this case, and there's a very good reason for it. If you can't win the scientific debate, politicise the issue and then try and f argue it on a political level and you'll have much more chance of stymieing the whole thing. It's what's happened, as far as I can see. I, I'm often concerned with how future people in the future and future generations are going to perceive what's happening now in the same way that I perceive things that happened in, in past generations. Um, with the internet turning into a, a giant archive, really, of, of what's been going on and with anyone with an opinion and a laptop and a motivation thinking that they're a journalist. Um, do you think that's a legitimate concern or am I just displaying a bit of presentism? <laughs> um, are you worried about the uh, overflow of information that no one can possibly uh, you know, get a handle on because it's just too much? Indeed, and I mean, in, in terms of um, news and media, I mean, in, in past generations, mm. people would always tune, tune into the same radio station or tune into the same news broadcast, which is curated or you know, collated by one person, whereas now it's so diverse. You could read any number of newspapers that have the same information, but are said in a slightly different way, depending on whether you're conservative, liberal, yep. whatever your drive is. Yep. And I think that's in some ways people are kind of pegging themselves in with the news sources that they seek out to find something that they agree with rather than learning something new. Yep. And well, I think, yeah, and the effect is also the opposite, at what I call the atomization of information. So you get such a proliferation of views that no one can get, there's no possibility of a consensus or mobilization or act of activists because it's just, it's just such a broad sort of canvas, no one can actually get um, a consensus view on key issues. Maybe we're still the early stages and, uh, of, of dealing with the internet age and we're still going to figure out how it all works and comes together, um, I'm not sure, but um, be wary of that generational argument that was at the start of your question. I remember my father, who was a decent human being, very decent guy, he used to say to me, you know, I don't know about you younger generation, you know, didn't live up to our standards, you know, you've let us down, not going to be quite as good. And my answer was always World War II, Auschwitz, you know, I mean, the 20th century was the worst century in human history and he was right at the centre of it. Um, every generation has some lots to be ashamed about, but I don't think this point scoring from the past is going to really uh, achieve very much. Hopefully we learn from these, uh, our history a bit and, and move forward and, and not commit the same errors that uh, the previous generation did. But we're going to have to deal with that in a way where information is coming from so many bewildering sources that um, how to filter it and how to channel it is going to be a, a real challenge. And I think uh, this university, like most others, is struggling to understand how, how to do that. How to, you know, when I went as an undergraduate, you have a reading list of, and everything on the reading list had tangible forms, a book or an article, and you could touch it and you, could, you knew there were limits, you know, and you waited for the book to come back before you could borrow it. Now, all that's gone. You don't even, you know, you just, uh, there are the limits, there are no limits and access is electronic. So how we deal with that, I don't know. I think we're still grappling with it, it's still the early stages. We've got a lot to learn about how it all, how it all work out. Uh, but I still think, in general spe generally speaking, um, access to more sources of information is overall a better thing than having uh, no access or limited access to only a f few, few views. Uh, and with that, I'd like everyone uh, to uh, just join your hands and thank Scott very much for his <laughs>